Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining us today for our expert panel. Um, today's panel is on spend management from cost center to customer experience driver. My name is Vijay Kurnamurthy. I'm the head of engineering here at Scale AI, and I'm very fortunate to be joined today by two amazing founders in this space. Um, first, we have Enrique Dubugras, the co-founder and co-CEO of Brex. And we have Dilip Dasman, the co-founder and CEO of Jeeves. Enrique and Dilip, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Great. So just to kick things off, um, you know, I want to start talking about the space and the companies that you founded here. Um, both Enrique and Dilip are founders and CEOs of two highly successful fintech startups. They're in the spend management space, um, but it's very interesting how this space has evolved since you've started your companies. Um, so starting with you, Enrique, you know, as a founder, what was the market opportunity you saw back in 2017 when you created Brex um, and how has it evolved since then? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the first thing that we saw in the market was that there was all these startups around that had raised millions of dollars and they couldn't get a corporate card. And we thought that makes absolutely no sense. How can you have like three million dollars in your bank account um, and still not be able to get a corporate card? Um, and, you know, that's kind of like the first uh, version of Rex was this uh, corporate card that underwrote you based on your cash balances um, and gave you a limit that was higher than anyone else, you know, and faster than anyone else. And that obviously did uh, super well and, you know, grew super quickly here in, in the U.S. Um, but what happened is that a lot of customers that started with us when they were really small, um, scale being uh, probably our first one, actually. Um, now evolved to, you know, having hundreds or even a thousand plus people. And, um, and then you have all these new needs that come from it, right? Around like controlling spend and around um, going global and, 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 and things like that. So uh, we're now evolving with the needs of our customers um, as they mature and become even larger companies. Great. Dilip, same question to you. Since starting Jeeves, how have you thought about this space and how has this space evolved? Um, for us, there was really two kind of central theses that we were building on. One was uh, companies are growing, going increasingly global, right? So whether you're paying a contractor, whether you have an employee in a different country, uh, you tend to have uh, the necessity to have banking functions in more than one region. Uh, so, you know, companies are going global. Banking is still very local, country specific, currency specific. And then the second one was we were just seeing this wave starting in terms of capital going internationally. Like when I started this a few years ago, the first question I get is how big is the market in Mexico? Like nobody asks that anymore because it's just obvious that there's capital going internationally. So there were these two massive waves that we're building on. And then what we did is we probably took about a year and a half to build out the infrastructure layer uh, because the real realization that we had is that if you want to be able to do banking in Brazil and in Colombia and in Mexico, uh, you need to have access to the data and the data itself is in different silos. So the first step is building a switching layer, abstraction layer, whatever you want to call it, where you can do the processing, you can do uh, the wires for different countries, et cetera. So that's where we kind of invested in. Uh, and then, you know, candidly, I think because of COVID, there was an even larger ramp up than we were expecting in terms of usage. But really that was a central thesis, which is if you look at this five years from now, 10 years from now, you're going to have more global companies than you have today. And they're still going to be local in terms of their banking because banking by definition is country and currency specific. That's great. You, you touched upon the big, you know, a kind of transformation that happened in, in all of our industries over the last two years. And that, that's really been the COVID pandemic and how that's accelerated certain trends. Um, Dilip, how, how has COVID kind of impacted um, this space and spend management in general? And, and what do you think is the ongoing impact? So, uh, yeah, I'm curious to hear Henrique's thoughts on this, because I think we have similar but very different perspectives and how it's affected the business. So for us, one of the biggest things we saw was the actual fact that you were kind of dislocated from your HQ. So now you can go live in Mexico and still work for a U.S. company. Now you can go, which a lot of people did, live in Portugal, still work for a Mexico-based company. And so you had this complete disconnect between where you needed to live and where you needed to work. So that was a big driver where before you might have had two employees, now you have a remote workforce that's remote first. And so now you're like, hey, do you support UK, Europe in terms of issuing cards, in terms of sending wires, et cetera, uh, that honestly we didn't expect it to be this fast this quickly because COVID accelerated that completely. And I think the second one, which is more structural, is just where you were seeing the spend. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure most spend management companies have a similar statistic, but for us it was primarily on virtual cards. So physical cards, 
we provided the virtual cards of where you're seeing most of your spend, and that number was just going up quicker and quicker. Uh, so for us, those are the two kind of core things. One is this actual, you know, dislocation between people being in one place and working in another, and then now needing financial infrastructure to support that. And then the second one is just the categories that we were seeing the spend on lent themselves more towards virtual cards, which spend management softwares tend to provide. Yeah, I would say um, I think both of those things are true and we are seeing similar patterns. Um, I would say to not repeat it, to add things. Um, I, I would say I would, I, I'd add, uh, you know, not just with COVID. I think COVID was actually the opposite. I would say now with kind of like the, the, the current macro, we're seeing more a pullback in spend in terms of like, you know, companies wanting to control cost a little bit more than they were before. Um, and I think the reason for that is, you know, before, if your product or service wasn't driving revenue, maybe it wasn't a priority. Now, you know, like we're seeing a lot of interest on um, products that help manage costs or manage spend in our case. Right. So I think that's one thing that it was a little bit after COVID but we're probably seeing. The second thing is, uh, I would say, probably the travel the pattern of travel. I think before we saw a lot of travel being the traditional salesperson who was traveling to visit customers and the field sales and had a whole, you know, experience. And I would say that, like, if you look at Amex and Concur, which are the big incumbents in our industry, right, that is the kind of core person that they're targeting, right, is this kind of like business traveler. And I think now we're seeing a lot more use cases for travel um, outside of, uh, of death back for use case. So people, um, you know, going to visit their coworkers, right? People going to um, do offsites and, and things like that. So I think that's been a, a big trend that we see just in the change of patterns of travel. And what that happened is just a lot more people in the companies are traveling. So before, you know, like um, if you look at an average like concur deployment, you know, maybe it would be like 10 to 20% of the people that were actually incurring expenses on behalf of the company, but the majority of them, they just don't travel, right? And I think that that's been changing in the sense that a lot more people in the company have now been incurring expenses and traveling and also, like I would say, around benefits, right? Like as people go work from home, they also have now these work from home stipends and other kind of perks um, that you need to do. People, some, some companies are, you know, asking people to buy their own computers, right? Instead of having to send computers, especially, I would say, internationally where shipping computers from the U.S. might be complicated. Um, mm -hmm. So we're just seeing a lot different patterns of spend happening um, as these companies uh, change their model. Yeah. You've also recently launched new platforms like Brex and Power this year um, that maybe also point to how you see a transformation in business. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Or are there aspects of how people think about spend management that are evolving that are leading you to think about new platforms? Yeah, absolutely. I think that... If we just think about distributed work in general, right? And when I say distributed, I'm not, I don't mean remote. I think that, you know, there's this whole discussion of like remote first, not remote first. And I think that's a, um, you know, uh, it's going to be an infinite discussion. And, you know, there's pros, there's cons, and uh, there's probably not a right answer or one size fits all. But one thing that I think everyone is realizing is that talent is everywhere, right? Talent is in the Bay Area, talent's in LA, talent's in Utah, talent's in London, talent's in Brazil. So I think no matter if you believe that, you know, in office or remote is better, I think most companies agree that there's talent everywhere and companies are becoming increasingly more distributed um, over time. And, and I think that, you know, if you look at one of the problems of going distributed is that the complexity of the business increases a lot, right? Like it's hard to manage people in one place, now try 10, right? In, again, in office or remote. Um, if you have people in a lot of places, there's a lot of complexity. And what happens traditionally when companies uh, start increasing complexity um, is that they tend to instill bureaucracy, right? And the way the bureaucracy happens is, hey, uh, you, you have this culture of increasing trust. So you start out, everyone's in the same office, you're seeing everything, you know, everyone is spending and, you know, and, and there's all this whole culture of trust. And then eventually that, that culture is broken, right? Like someone goes and breaks that trust. So someone, you know, for Brex, it was uh, this engineer that went to um, a, a Alexander Steakhouse and bought $3,000 worth of Wagyu beef. Um, and we were super upset about it. We were like, hey, this is not the kind of culture that we want to have, you know, like, and how can someone humiliate so much beef? But um, 
and then what happens is you that trust is broken and then you implement some sort of process to kind of fix that, right? So you're like, okay, let's make sure this never happens again. And now everyone in the company has to review expenses, upload receipts, upload memos, you know, go to multi-step approvals because of that one dude that went to Alexander Steakhouse. Um, and then all the, all the process in the company kind of happens because of that, right? Because um, you, you have some tail event that then, you know, implement the process and then everyone suffers because of the 1%. So we decided to build Empower to do the opposite. It's like, how do we build a process and a system that supports a process that empowers the 99% of people and make it super easy for them instead of, you know, optimizing for that 1%. And I think like a lot of uh, competitors that we see, they're like, look, we're going to have to get that 1% and go to 0.5%, you know? And we're saying, hey, no, we're going to focus on the 99% of people who are actually trying to do the right thing. And how can we make sure they're doing the right thing and have the controls um, in place and the systems in place to enable that you're still in compliance and in control, but without making this blunt process of making everyone do everything, you know, for, for, for the company. So that's kind of the thesis behind Empower. Great. For those of you in the audience who don't know Alexander's Steakhouse, and there's one a few blocks from us here in San Francisco, it is believable you could spend $3,000 on Wagyu like beef. Maybe not for one person. But yeah, that's for a it was two people, but yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, great. I, you know, one reason we all know each other and work together is, um, you know, we all use uh, AI as part of our, our core business routines. Um, you know, both Jeeves and Brex use our scale document AI as a product. Um, it's really a product built around taking unstructured data, getting high quality structured data at the other end, often which powers AI and machine learning routines that you've built in your business around. Um, you know, starting with you, Dilip, how is machine learning um, been a core part of how you've built your business? How do you see machine learning going forward? And, and how do you bring kind of a machine learning life cycle to bear for the problems that you face? Yeah, so so a few thoughts there. So one, you know, I think it's always a interesting journey for most startups where it's just like you start and you're like, oh, this works at 400 companies, but it doesn't work at 4,000 and 5,000. And so we're pretty firmly in that box now where what we did last year as we were growing and scaling doesn't work at the same velocity this year. And so that's one side. And then the second side is we do do the full banking suite uh, internationally. So we do cards, wires, lending, et cetera. And as I'm sure everybody knows, it's very easy to give money out. The hard part is actually getting paid back and collecting the money on the other side, right? And so for us, a lot of this comes back to the data, right? Your AI models, machine learning is only as good as the data that you have. You don't have good data, you're not going to have good AI or good machine learning, whatever you want to call it. So we look at it in two boxes. One is how do we actually make the user's experience better. And then the second one is how do we actually reduce risk in the sense of making sure we don't have losses, making sure we're able to collect. Because if you do have it, everybody's cost goes up. It's not just one company, it affects the entire pool. And so when we think about you know, AI, machine learning, the two subsets are one, how do we get unstructured data into a structured method? And then the second one is how do we actually use AI or machine learning depending on which sequence it is, to actually analyze that data to make better decisions. So the easy, obvious one is underwriting, right? Like you think about even just the data that we have, the plumbing, right? How do you benchmark a Series B company in Colombia versus Mexico? How do you create a Dun & Bradstreet internationally? The data is all in silos. In the US, it's there. In the international, it's not there. And it's in different silos. And so for us, the whole component of how do you get right data and then read the data to make that actionable is critical to the business. And that's one big area that we kind of use AI. And then the second one is, you know, I think where we probably can do better uh, is more around the recommendations, like how do you improve your usage, reduce spend, et cetera. But internationally, it's still a little bit earlier. Like it's not at that stage where the reducing the spend and savings is the core item. The core item is actually giving you a payment method that isn't as annoying as going to your local bank and spending three hours talking to someone. That's still the actual pain point, right? And one of the key things that we realize is in the US, it's a large single market with a single currency. Internationally, because it's so fragmented, if you're in Mexico and you're growing as a company, guess what? You're going to be in Colombia next. And now you have a separate currency, a separate wire system, a separate lending system, and all of that has operational complexity. So for us, it always comes back to how do we get the data? Then what do we do with the data? It's just that internationally, the data is not as clean. It's not in the one silo you just plug into and pull it out of. You actually have to go through different silos to get the data itself. Enrique, same question for you. You know, Do you find AI is a key part of how you build these operational processes and workflows? And especially as you've also grown globally, does AI play a role in you understanding nuances of local markets? Yeah, for sure. I would say that the main use cases for us today um, are basically trying to replace 
uh, humans on tasks that they're supposed to do, but they actually don't, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that if you think about the traditional process, you went and you spent money on Alexander Steakhouse or whatever. Um, the, the thing that's supposed to happen is your manager is supposed to see that, see what you spend money on, evaluate, is this reasonable? Is this not reasonable? And then either, you know, approve or reject these transactions, right? Um, and the reality is that managers just don't do that because they have no time and they trust their teams. Um, and I think everyone can relate, like how many of us have actually gone expense by expense, looked at the receipt, you know, and try to match it and like see if it's in policy, not in policy. A lot of people don't even know what the policy is. Um, so I think that's like, for example, one of the use cases that we use AI is like, hey, how can we automate that? So managers are only spending their time looking at things that are out of policy. But if we know that this is clearly in policy, you know, we can automatically approve it and, and send it, you know, um, send it on the way, right? Um, and, uh, and some of them are easier than others, right? Like knowing that you're under $75 a day for a meal stipend, that's very easy. Um, knowing if there's alcohol in the meal that you purchase, that's a little bit harder. Um, making sure that even if you bought tickets on booking.com instead of using the corporate travel program because you find, found cheaper flights on Google Flights or whatever than you did on your travel tool, which again happens all the time, we can still enforce policy and give you reporting and do all the things, you know, of like a corporate travel booking would, right? So um, again, these are all things that finance teams expect humans to do, but on practice, they don't. And we're trying to automate uh, with AI to make sure everyone gains leverage in the process. I'm um, staying on the theme of the global environment. I, I wanted to ask about the current macroeconomic economic environment that, you're, that we're all facing. Um, and how companies are navigating through this current crisis that we're going through. Um, you know, Dilip, starting with you, how are customers approaching digital transformation, you know, change in their core business functions in today's climate? And are, are there challenging barriers right now, either based on the economic environment or even cultural barriers as, as a global company like yours um, that, that really lead to barriers to adoption that companies have to overcome? Yeah, um, so I guess on the first question, you know, we're definitely seeing a lot more demand, but we're also seeing a change in the risk profile. Um, so the company itself needs some form of funding, uh, some form of spend. These are you know companies that still might have good fundamentals, uh, but there's a lot of companies that even we were like, oh, they're definitely fine and they're gonna pay, blah, blah. Then now it's like, uh, we're coming up to that line where we might not feel comfortable extending card or extending credit again. So. It, it, it is going to be something that is going to unfortunately have, you know, companies that do not survive uh, in the next 12 months. And I think a big part of our job and just even in terms of keeping the company alive uh, is making sure we get those decisions right. Right. So when the risk profile is usually in the middle and now it's moving a little bit to the left or the right, we need to kind of adjust both the product that we offer and the companies that we take on board. I think one big difference between kind of what we do because it's across a lot of different countries is our subset is fairly small. Like our subset is not like, even if you look at competitors in Mexico, they tend to be more longer tail because that product is deeper in Mexico. Whereas ours is more of like, I think that more as a boutique bank, it's for a smaller subset, but you multiply that subset by 40, 60 countries and you get a pretty massive tank. So, you know, for us really where we spend a lot of cycles is making sure we are actually able to figure out uh, which of these companies you know, might make it, might not make it in terms of the funding side, but more than the funding, even cash flow. Like we're seeing that now with cash flow businesses like e-commerce, et cetera, where there are market changes that are affecting just their ability to stay in business. And so a fundamental change is happening. We've spent a lot of this year really doubling down our fraud and risk. Uh, but I do think once we get into next year, you're going to see a lot of demand because there are structural changes happening in the market in terms of capital going out, in terms of new ideas coming into these different regions that I think is a real thing. It just also overlaps with this increasing macro macroeconomic interest rate happening at the same time as well. Um, internally, you know, we actually didn't hire uh, as much. So we are a little bit on the smaller side. So we are still hiring there. Um, but I think what we're seeing is kind of what every company is seeing, which is like, how do you turn something that's a cost center into something that drives revenue? Like partnerships is a good example. It used to be brand partnerships. Now it's like, what is the revenue that that partnership is driving, right? And so just like most companies, we're kind of looking at that across the board. Um, and we feel like we're in a pretty good place uh, to kind of expand on what we're built out here. And then for us, we look at this almost 
as some form of like a portfolio play, right? If we have limited resources and we're operating today in 24 countries, which is a country that's going to return the most against the resource that we're putting? And, you know, we don't compete really in the US. That's not a core market because we have exceptional products like Brex, Ramp, et cetera, et cetera, in market, right? So that's part of like the decisions we make, which is across the portfolio, where does it make the most sense to kind of invest into and take that away from another region? So that's an internal exercise that we're going through as well to kind of adjust to the macroeconomic climate. Great. Enrique, you also get a lot of visibility into these structural changes that are happening and how budgets are evolving with some of your customers. Are, are there any trends that you're seeing, especially this year, um, as we navigate this uncertain macro environment? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, all the stuff you would imagine around people focusing more on costs, reducing spend. But I will say, um, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty focused, as uh, Dilip said, on, on U.S. companies, but we are seeing a lot of... Uh, push from U.S. companies to go global and because it is cheaper. If you look at your biggest spend, right, like your biggest spend, you can optimize it a little bit here and there, but like your biggest spend is payroll. And uh, if you can hire engineers to ship product that generates revenue in cheaper locations, I think that's like a trend that, you know, uh, we're, we're all seeing. Um, so, and I think it's a very important trend for the world um, and something that's very positive. Uh, the other thing I would say is... Uh, just more like tight control over costs. You know, I think before everything was like, hey, just move fast and spend money. Now it's like, hey, move fast and just spend money in the right places. Like we don't want to like make sure we're moving slow because like you can't save your way to a startup success, right? Um, you can't like, you need to spend to grow and you need to spend to be successful, but you just want to make sure that your resources are getting allocated to where they generate the most value instead of, you know, to where there's waste. So um, we're definitely seeing, uh, you know, a trend of like people not necessarily say, hey, we would just want to reduce spend overall. There's some of that, but also like, how can we like reallocate spend for where it drives more, uh, more value versus like in places that it doesn't. In terms of what you believe about bureaucracy and cutting red tape and, and how spend management can be a, a key part of that, um, how do you see your tools kind of, uh, you know, empowering uh, that kind of transformation? You know, less bureaucracy, um, more trust, more uh, accountability at, at the lower level. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, how you see that evolving? Yeah, for sure. So um, we built some power of a couple principles that I think are how we, we see. We actually apply the same principles to a lot of other processes at the company. Um, but the first one is this concept of, like, make it easy to do the right thing, right, which is, I think like a lot of um, uh, the, the intuition of a lot of people is, look, if, if employees are not doing something, let's create teeth. Let's create like a, a stick. And then like if they don't do this, we're going to like punish them somehow. And um, and look, that's a way to do it. But it's actually like super painful. Like people don't do it, still don't do it, because especially like more senior people, they're like, you're not going to fire me over this, you know. Um, and uh and they end up like, it just ends up being like the, this negative thing. And finance teams end up being like the bad cop, the person who's like preventing them from doing their job. Instead, what we believe is like, hey, how can we build or adopt a system that makes it so easy to do the right thing that you end up doing it, right? So, for example, like what's the, um, what is the, you know, one of the things people hate the most is gathering receipts. What's the best way to not have gather receipts is just Brex automating it, right? So we have a goal of, automating over 90% of receipt collection for customers, um, you know, over the next 18 months. And that's the best way, right? Like better than like saying, hey, if you don't submit your receipts, we're going to do something bad to you. Um, so that's like one of the the, the, the principles. The, the, the second one we believe is this um, concept of like managing by exception, right? Which is uh, instead of like having to review all of your expenses all the time, how can you flag the ones that are most relevant and, you know, kind of auto approve the rest? Because the reality is like, if there's too many transactions or too many instances, people don't, don't look at it, right? Like it's just, um, it, no one has time or energy to go and do it. So how can you actually create a better, even a better control layer by selecting the things that are out of policy and having people review it? And have this concept of like, hey, managing what you think is at risk instead of having to bluntly approve and see everything. And think about it. It's a principle that can be, a, you know, done to almost any part of the company where <laughs> there, there, there's something, right? Um, um, and, and then the third one is like um, increase accountability through visibility. So the only way to actually do this is if you actually like 
have visibility into what's happening because if you're only going to get a, a report three months from now when the spend is already done, the world has already moved on, it's really hard, right? Like to have that level of trust. But if you have a system in place that can give you real time visibility into what's happening and you can kind of control it as it happens instead of three months later and more in real time, it's much easier to get someone accountability. So um, it's, it's much easier to say, hey, go do your thing. We trust you if you have full visibility, but if it's a black box and you're only gonna find out you know, months later, then it's, it's hard, right? You wanna have some more process ahead of time. Um, so everything that we build, like we think through these principles and uh, both in spend management, which is where we play, but also in our company when thinking about building process. Yeah. Philippe, when, when you think about your own company principles at Jeeves or your customers' principles, is there an aspect of spend management that changes how you think about trust and accountability and, and core values that you bring to your business? Um, so, I, so I think international is a little interesting because uh, I think a lot of times, you know, if you come in with a perspective from uh, the U.S., I mean, I grew up here, uh, it always it, it doesn't always work the way you think it does. So one of the things, for instance, is, you know, internationally tends to be a little more top heavy. Right. And so even if you have the functionality, there's a big component around education. Uh, of how to use the functionality. And I remember talking to one CFO and he's like, no, no, I want to be the one person that proves everything. That's the whole point. And so I'm like, okay, well, what if you had better insights, right? So it makes your job easier. So you still want to prove it. You still want to see it, but it makes your life. So you're not spending four hours. You can do it in one hour, right? And so I think there's a there's a box where it's not exactly the same as may, it might be in the US where there's capital tends to be a little bit cheaper. So you can have a room with four people that are looking at accounting and receipts. But I do think it still goes back to the same principle, which is if you make the life easier for really the way we see it as kind of like the decision maker, then it propagates much quicker within the organization. And so we have made a concentrated effort to get to that point where an organization is using, you know, more than 10 cards, right? Whereas in the beginning, it tended to be, yeah, they'd sign up, they'd spend, but it would be like three people, all the C level, that's about it. And no one else is spending at the company. And so that's not representative, in my opinion, of what an expense management software can be. But the second layer that I think you have internationally that you might not as much in the US is that there's an education component of like, you can trust the guy in marketing. He's not gonna go away with it because here's how you can check it. And if he does, you'll get a notification and we'll, you know, flag it. like. That education cycle uh, is a second layer um, that, you know, we see a lot more often kind of internationally. And then I think the last one for us is uh, because we do multi bins for card issuing in multiple countries, there's a second layer of like, OK, how do you look at this across, you know, Colombia and Mexico? Like, what does that look like when it comes up on the same screen? And then how do you actually manage that in one way where you're not stepping on the toes of someone in Colombia, even though you can see it in Mexico? So those are new things that honestly we didn't think through completely in the beginning. We we're like, oh, this is awesome. Like people should love this. And then now it's like, OK, awesome, cool. But like, what are the processes around that that actually makes a guy's job or girl's job easier? Uh, so that's kind of where we spend a lot more of our cycles now, which is like you build it. Awesome. You got all this feedback. Now, like how good is the educational layer? Like, do they already get it? Is this something that you have to go talk to them? Maybe you got it wrong to begin with, but like, how do you get that second layer of feedback around just basic usage cases? Yeah, Philippe, I, I love that you're talking about the education cycle that, that you have, the education layer. It, you know, it leads to my next question, which is really around how you talk to your customers about AI and, and machine learning. Um, we've often seen, you know, as an AI platform that when we talk to customers, there's sometimes a lot of fear and uncertainty over how AI and decision making are made, you know, especially where it impacts someone's operational processes. Um, I'm curious, you know, how do you think about talking to customers about AI and how that leads to an education cycle um, within the, the spend management space? Um, so I, I think there are two components to this. The one which I don't think you can ever breach is around trust, right? So the whole thing is, you know, it's, it's a contract. I'm giving you my data to help you make better decisions, but there's an inherent trust to that. You break the trust, you're not getting my data. You break it for one person, you're not getting it for anybody. So that is a separate box that, you know, it should have the highest bar possible because it is kind of a binary outcome. It goes once, you're not getting that back. I think the second part, which is where, again, we spend a lot more time, is what does the customer get in return for providing access to data or AI? I think AI as a concept is a little bit arbitrary and it's also a little bit opaque, right? AI, machine learning, everything is a form of data analysis, you know. So it's a little hard to get to that level. It's more like, okay, here's what our AI can actually do for you. Here's what is gonna save you hours of time. Here's why you as a CFO can do a better job 
because you now know what the spend categories are for everybody. And then here's why we as a company need this connection because that lowers our rate for everybody. Like everybody benefits because you get to connect to us. So I see it as two boxes. The first one, which I don't think is ever negotiable is trust, right? And, and you know, as a young company, you learn that very, very quickly. Uh, and you kind of have to get that right because if you don't get it right, uh, you know, it's much harder to win that back. And then I think the second one is more around what's in it for me, which is the most like basic, you know, human nature at some level, which is like, yes, I get AI, cool, cool, cool. What am I actually getting in return for giving you this data, connecting my tax returns, providing all of this information that, you know, I wouldn't have otherwise that would make my life worse. All right, Enrique, I, I'll ask the same question to you. You know, customers probably know that Brex is an AI powered solution that they're gonna adopt. Um, do you find there's an education cycle where you have to talk to customers and get them on board with the idea that AI is gonna drive some pretty critical decisions for their business? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the you know, in our industry in finance, there's always that the way things were done, right? And the way things are done is this like command and control model where everyone is reviewing everything. You're having tea for the employees if they don't do this. They're going to get punished. And when we're saying, hey, we're turning that upside down, right? Like we're making it super easy to the employees, making it easy to do the right thing, automatically approving things that are in policy and flagging things out of policy. There's comes a lot of, uh, you know, basically thinking, hey, is this actually going to work? Is this AI thing you're telling me actually going to flag the right things? Is it actually like it's not going to pass something that, you know, it's going to lose me my job, right? And I think that, they're kind of like trust in the system and trust in the AI is still something that we have to fight against. But I think once they're on board and they're seeing everything working and their, you know, their time is so much more efficient and users love it. And they go from being the finance bad cop to being the superhero that, you know, enable the entire company to move faster and to, you know, deploy resources more appropriately, like then that changes. That's great. Given that you as a founder have figured out how to talk to customers about AI and build that trust in, in how AI is powering critical business decisions, do you have advice for other founders that are also in this space that have to think about um, AI and how you talk to customers about it and, and the role that AI is going to play in, in business transformation? Um, well, I, I do think that there, there's a couple of things. So one is I love the model where it's the AI plus humans model, because I think that there's a lot of problems that AI by itself is not enough, right? So um, in our industry, there's a lot of examples where, look, the models only get to 80%, 85%, 90%, but there's still the other 10%. Um, and I think uh, finding a business model or finding a model where you can get to like 99, 99.9% .9 with the help of humans, I think it is kind of like a very unique thing that also reinforces and gets the model better over time. So I would say like, don't shy away from that. I think as like engineers, a lot of times we have this thing is like, I, if there's humans in the loop, then it's, it's ugly. It's not pretty, you know, it's not fully beautiful and automated. Um, and I actually, I, my intuition is always the opposite. I actually love the humans in the loop because I know that things are not going to work a hundred percent of the time from day one. And if you can like make it better over time, um, I think that's like a, a, a very smart way to, to kind of like approach the problem. The second thing I'd say is like, look, I think you either have to make the investment or don't. Like AI talent in the market is one of the most competitive talents in the world, right? Like if there's one type of person that's really hard to hire are like AI engineers. And so I think you either go all in and say like, hey, I'm going to spend however many tens of millions of dollars in building this out and being like amazing at it, or you don't. Um, and you use a partner and, you know, you kind of leverage, you know, their scale. I think the middle of the way is kind of complicated because you didn't just have like worse models that you can buy off the shelf. Um, and I think that that's probably the, the worst of all world. So those probably be my, my two pieces of advice. Yeah. Great. Dilip, same question to you. You know, do you have any advice for other founders, given that every enterprise startup right now is talking about AI and it's a core part of what they do? Do you have advice for founders on how you talk to customers, how you talk to the industry um, about AI and the role that it plays? So I think uh, just two thoughts on this. So one, uh, I think going back to a point I, I think I uh, talked about earlier, um, I think it's important to just be very clear about what you mean by AI as a founder, right? Because it's a very big catch-all term that can go from just, you know, pretty much any kind of algorithm to operational model to machine learning. It can be a lot of different things. It could be like your thing that you have in the back of your head and you just have like this catch-all phrase. So I think the first thing is just being very clear about what 
it is that you are building with AI. Uh, and then I think to Hendrik's point, a lot of times, you know, you might not have the skill set internally to do that. Like we might not have the ability to build that out fully ourselves. So like, do you need someone else that can provide that? Like you don't need to go build OCR software from scratch. Like there are better people doing that better than you and you can go use that instead. And then for me, what it comes back to is it, it still comes back to that trust component, which is a lot of times if you say something, you should at least have it tested where your core functionality works 90, 95% of the time. Because the worst thing is like, oh, we're building this beautiful model. It's always going to work. And, you know, you take it out for a run for the first time with your customer. And it's like, this doesn't work, right? So basically for me, it comes back to those two things. One, just being very clear, like pushing, pushing, pushing internally for you. Hopefully you have a co-founder or hopefully you have like other people that can do it. But like, what do you mean by AI? Like what exactly is it doing that we're not doing today or you can't get off the shelf or you can't get the humans like be very crisp up about it and then the second part is like once you do go test it out whatever it is that you're building out whatever is that 100 percent, sorry 90 percent use case like it has to be there at least 90 95 100 percent of the time because once you tell the customer and they expect that and they don't see that then the next time you tell them you have something else you've already lost that credibility the first time so for us, like we prefer kind of using it internally, testing it out, like make sure it works before we go out and be like, hey, this is something that can make your life easier. But, you know, that's kind of just internal to how we run it. Great. D Dilip, for you, what's the next big opportunity within your organization? How did you figure out, you know, prioritizing the work that you're doing this year? And do you feel like there, there's a huge opportunity that's in front of you that, um, you know, given everything, you would you would allocate all your resources to tackling that given just the, the scope of what the opportunity is to I mean, I think that's a constant kind of ongoing battle of like, which, you know, fire are you kind of putting out or which ball are you juggling? I think the, the, just a few points on this for us, you know, and, and I really do believe this. I think expense management as a space uh, is still pretty early, right? We're still like a small, small subset of a massive, massive space, uh, even though like there are certain things that are becoming commoditized. But I think doing it at scale is very, very different from like just starting it out, right? Like, so doing it at scale is building the processes, becoming kind of at a point where you have the risk controls, you have fraud detection, all of these things that you don't really need as much when you're younger. Uh, so what gets us excited is still the fact that we are, you know, pretty early in this journey to building a global business bank that can function in any country and any currency. Today we do expense management, meaning we have cards, we have payments, uh, we don't do deposits to treasury, and then we have lending as well. And so when I look at like a bank, I see it as payments, which is cards and B2B payments, I see it as lending, which we have today, and then I see deposits and treasury. And when you have all three, you become the bank of G. So for us, the next like logical step here is how do we expand uh, the payment stack that we have? So we have a big product called Jeeves Pay that's coming out very shortly. Uh, and then, you know, an extension from that is just being very, very crucial and critical about the type of customer that we want to go after. I think one of the big things that happen, happens to early state founders is you see a lot of demand and you're like, oh, this can work for a lot of different customers. And we're trying to force ourselves to be very, very focused of like, it's just one subset. It's a global company that has operations in different countries and they need to close their books. Like they can't do that today. That's what we can help. That's unique to us, right? And so it's much easier than it sounds. It's a constant daily thing of like reminding yourself that and being able to say no a lot more than you say yes. So, Yeah. Great. Enrique, same question for you. You just launched Brex and Power. What's, what's the next big product opportunity you're taking on and, you know, is informed by customer conversations? Are, are they coming to you and they're asking for... For, for the next big platform and you're you're currently allocating your resources to think about it. Yeah, for sure. Look, I think that, um, you know, we launched Brex and Power as kind of like a general platform. I think the next step for us is diving deep into the actual use cases. So like what's the T&E use case end to end, right? And what do we need to build there to make that amazing? What's the procurement flow end to end? How do we can make that amazing? What's the benefits flow end to end? How we can make that amazing? Um, so uh, I think, you know, we, we built Empower and it's like an amazing, like kind of like platform. And I think we can make the uh, individual experience for all the types of spend a lot better. So that's, you know, something we're working on right now. Perfect. Well, with two minutes left, you know, I just wanted to ask, you know, starting with you, Dilip, you know, we oftentimes find ourselves in the of being long-term thinkers and we're thinking through what the industry will look like 10 years from now. Um, I, I'm curious from you, you know, as you think 10 years out, what do you see the future of how work um, and our relationship to work um, is empowered by your platform. Um, you know, how do you see that playing out in, in the industry? Yeah, you know, I, I think the core concept is is still there, right? Which is, you know, if you are someone that is 
like, like, why do we have finance? Why do we have funding? It's to make someone's life a little bit easier, right? Someone that's selling cans or, you know, bottles, like they don't really care about what happens on the back end. Like they want to go out there, be able to sell, close their books, move on to the next thing. So for me, when I look at what happens five years, 10 years from now, I think it's a really exciting time because you can rebuild the stack in a way that you couldn't five years or seven years ago. Like Jeeves could not have existed seven years ago because the stack itself was not there. So I call it V2 and V3 of fintech where you can build on a layer that wasn't there before. How do you completely reimagine like American Express? Like why does American Express have two cards in two countries? Why can't you have one card that switches a bin across the countries, right? Like the, this is what I see this going into. It's not like take one or take another. It's just you have one usage scenario. Everything else happens in the back end. What country are you? What currency are you? Are you using this for, you know, to Hendrik's point, so procurement or TNE? Everything else happens in the back end. You just spend. That's it. And then you go do your job. So I don't think we're there. I think there's many steps to get there. But I do think it's an exciting time to build because you can build things that you could not have built four or five years ago because that initial layer of that infrastructure wasn't there. Uh, and so for me, that's the most exciting thing. I think we're very, very far away from that position, but we're you know starting in that direction. Perfect. Ricky, same question to you. 10 years out, what do you think the future of work is going to be? I'm very big on distributed companies. And again, that's not uh, in office or uh, remote, but I think it is companies hiring people everywhere in their country and the world. Um, and I think that there's going to be a lot of platforms that need to exist to enable that. Um, like Jeeves and Brex, for example, you know, can help on the money side. Um, but also, you know, Slack and Zoom and Google Docs, right? All of these are tools that enable you to run the company a lot more distributed than before. Um, so I, I'm super big on, com on, on tools that keep developing that, keep making it easier uh, to run your team and from many locations and for people to collaborate in many different locations. And I think, uh, you know, that's how we're going to operate in the future. Perfect. With that, Dalip of Jeeves, Enrique of, of Brex, I'm very blessed to have your time today. And thank you so much for taking the opportunity to talk about the future of work and how AI is empowering the, the future of your businesses. Thanks, Vijay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.